Welcome, Tale Tellers. It's a terrifying Tuesday, and ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a treat. I have Michi's Journey Part 3 just for you today, and I can't wait to sink my teeth into it. I wanted to use this time to say some special thank yous to those leaving iTunes reviews, because I know it takes time to leave those reviews, and iTunes puts you awesome listeners through a lot of hoops. And on that note, I want to give shout outs to those that have. Also, if I've missed you, please let me know. I can only see those who leave a comment behind. So let me know who you are, because I do want to thank you. Okay, let's go. The Lady Devere, from USA. I can't stop listening. I discovered horror narrations last October and found it helpful to pass the time whilst working at the greenhouse. I've been through a few narrators and this fellow, here, has got some great skill and depth. I really enjoy how he flexes between different personality styles of Tales of the Macabre. I'm currently barreling through every episode and absolutely loving every creepy moment. Keep up the good work, mate. Thank you so much, the Lady Devere. I really appreciate it. B. Wanshon from Australia. Enjoyable. High quality podcast with consistent uploads. Recommended. Chris. Vilhest from Norway. Awesome stories, great narration. Thanks for putting these out almost daily. I love listening to them on the Metro. Cheers. And cheers to you, Vilhest. WD40 USA. That's a good name. Addicted and binging. <laughs> Found your station two days ago and have listened to over 30 episodes. Love your knowledge of vampires, types and origins. More on werewolves, skinwalkers and other cryptids. Your friend, WD40, down in the heart of Dixie. Keep it up, mate. I will, just for people and fans, just like you. Thanks a lot. Green Turtle 1983, <laughs> great name, from the USA. Great way to end the day. I stumbled across this podcast by good luck. Great to listen to after a long evening of work. Entertaining, creepy, and funny at times. Awesome material and stories. Thank you so much, Green Turtle 1983. And I've also got my authors to thank regarding the awesome material. Game to Relax from the USA. Love this. If you want to hear stories that will keep you on the edge of your seat, please subscribe to SFGT. Aw, oh, thank you. I'm lucky to have fans like you, buddy. Sam Ferdum from the USA. A-plus storytelling. Have tore through most of these episodes in a week. Narrator is excellent. Well, thank you. Dan Summersan from the USA. Maybe he's related to the last person. Atmospheric and enthralling. Great variety and informative episodes with a productive creator and eerie production. Nothing to dislike. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Jesse Clark 152 from the USA. Now, I know this guy. This guy is an author. I think he actually writes it in his review. Let's see what he has to say. Would give six stars if I could. <laughs> that's very nice. I wrote the What Really Happened to Andersonsburg? Pennsylvania in April 1829 story that SFG turned into a four-parter, and I was blown away by the quality of work and the score and the sound effects. Simple and top-notch all the same. Everyone who loves great horror and quality storytelling needs to make SFG a staple of their podcast diet. Wow, now that is flattery. Thank you so much, mate. Be sure to check out the Jesse Clark on Reddit to find out more about his stories. He is brilliant at writing freaky horror stories that bounce around your mind for days, trust me. And lastly, but by no means least, Happy 1979. Just wow. I listen to podcasts on my way to work each day, and this has easily become one of my favorite to go to. You do an excellent job reading, and the stories have always held my attention. Just know that your hard work is appreciated. That is absolutely fantastic to hear. Thank you so much, Happy 1979. You've made me very happy. So, I'm blown away by these reviews, really. Not only does this help people spot the channel, but it really helps it grow, and the authors on here gain a wider audience. So thank you so much to you iTunes reviewers. I really do appreciate it. And riding this awesome wave, let's jump into the fantastical story that is Michi's journey. I woke up this morning and headed to the bathroom Upon washing my face, I saw a tuft of my hair had turned white overnight. How the hell? I asked surprised. 
I decided to head to the site earlier than my team. It was still twilight when I arrived as I walked up the mountain. Something lingered on the edge of my peripheral vision, some kind of outline. That's all though. But as I reached the entrance, I felt a huge number of eyes on me again. What the hell is up with this feeling? I asked, absent-minded. Michi's journal was safe in my pack as I approached the temple, though the feeling of the eyes intensified. I ignored it and continued on my way to one of the meditation rooms inside the temple. I placed my battery-powered lantern down, which illuminated the room as I set out some incense and lit them. As I pulled the journal out, I had wrapped it in a shirt to prevent any unwanted trips into the life of Michi. I placed the book down and unwrapped it. Show me what else you have, I said, placing my hand on the cover and turning to the page I left off on. And just like that, I was dragged to the point at which Michi was recovering from his wounds. Months after Michi had fought his first yokai, he had healed. His stomach had a puncture scar and a slight dip in his collarbone on the left side. During the recovery phase, he trained as if he wasn't injured. When asked by the senior monks why he did this, he responded, Yokai, don't care what shape I'm in. I must get stronger. A young man came to the temple and asked to see a warrior monk. So the older monks brought Michi in to talk to the man. Yes, how may I help you? He asked the young man. The man looked skeptical, but answered as best as he could. My village has had our men and women disappearing lately, and large amounts of spider silk has been appearing. Michi pondered for a minute. It seems like either a Tsukigumo or a Jorogumo, he stated as he kept pondering. Has there been an attractive woman who moved into town recently? He asked, raising an eyebrow and catching a glimpse of his reflection in the mirror. In the corner, he noticed a small patch of his raven black hair had turned white. The young man answered, No, just a young child and his grandmother. With his mind made up, Michi took the job and packed up to follow the young man back to the village. While in his room, Michi inspected the tuft of white hair. Well, looks like I've gained the spirit taint, he said as he headed to the temple's entrance to meet the young man. The two men departed for the village, which was two days away. They talked as they walked, and they stopped to rest in a couple of villages along the way, which yielded a couple of jobs to complete on the way back, but the one he was doing right now was more important. Upon arriving at the village, he was greeted by grim faces. While the young man was gone, four more people went missing. Michi tried to comfort the townspeople as he placed his katana on his hip from his pack just in case. Where is the house of the old woman and child? The townspeople pointed to a house on the edge of the village right against the forest. You folks were fooled. By a skigumo. It's a spider yokai that can create illusions. Michi walked up to the nearest house, producing four talismans and placing them in the four cardinal directions, and muttered his spell. And just like that, the illusion disappeared to show hundreds, if not thousands, of strands of spider silk draped over the house. Everyone, come to me, he instructed as he produced a large amount of talismans. Go home, and lock yourself in till I arrive to tell you it's safe. But before leaving the house, slip this paper under the door, and wait. If there is no flash of light, it is safe to leave. He handed each villager a talisman, and they scurried like cockroaches into their houses. Now, he could get to work. He ran all around the village, dispelling the illusion and revealing a large silk tube in the canopy around the village. This was its hunting grounds. It would devour the entire village if he hadn't been there. Michi sat in the middle of the village, waiting for the monster to attack. A sweet little old woman approached him. Hey, Sonny, where is everyone? She asked innocently as she approached him. Michi had a trap set up already. He reached for the old woman's hand. I don't know. Why don't you tell me where you live and I can escort you to your home? He said, playing the role of the concerned monk. Well, aren't you a sweet young man? She said as he reached for his hand. Upon making contact, a large white flash of light erupted from Michi's hand. 
and dispelled the illusion the beast had created. Michi leapt back from the Skigumor, putting about five feet between them. As the illusionary silk cleared, in the place of the old lady was a huge spider, roughly eight feet tall and fourteen feet long. Its leg span was well over twenty feet. Michi shuddered at the sight. Well, the nine cut spell will be too weak for this. He gripped to himself as he drew his katana and took a high stance. The Skigumor stood its ground and spoke with a voice that seemed laid of three different kinds of voices. Why can't I hunt in peace? You human does not trouble them. It raised two hairy legs and brought them down over Michi. Michi turned the blade into a flare and made two small movements reflecting the legs to either side of his body, where they slammed into the earth, causing two decent sized holes. The beast lurched forward, its large fangs extended to impale Michi on them. Michi took his non-dominant hand off the hilt of the katana and yelled, Kick! As a wall of light shot up in front of his face, and the monster smashed into it full force. Causing the wall to bend slightly, Michi drew a symbol in the dirt with his left foot and stomped on it, after which that foot was engulfed in flames. He dropped the Kekai at the same time as he positioned the sword to deflect the fangs over his shoulder. He then shot up his right leg behind him, pulling up the arc of flames, smashing it into the underside of the monster's face, causing its massive head to jut up. Michi used this opportunity to hop back out of the monster's range. He made sure to drag his left foot from the symbols he drew earlier to the new spot, as he noticed that some of the hair had ignited on the monster, but was quickly smothered out when the monster flopped to the floor and shimmied from side to side. I'm going to enjoy eating you. Its layered voice rang out again. Michi took out two talismans as he drew another symbol with his foot again. This time, he launched a talisman at the monster, and they exploded in midair, obscuring the monster's view, but in turn, obscuring Michi's own view. At this point, the monster lobbed two web balls through the smoke at Michi. Luckily, he was able to block one with the Kakai, but the second one, but the second one, he tried to cut through the sword, but instead, the ball stuck to it, connecting a thread from the ball that held the katana to the monster. At this point, Michi felt a tug, and the weapon flew from his hands. Let's see, how well you do without, without your little toy? It dropped from above him, fangs poised to strike at his shoulder. Michi quickly reached up and grabbed the fangs safely, holding them back before stomping on the symbol he drew earlier. As he did this, he could feel the ground change. A large pillar of wood sprouted from the symbol, preventing the full weight of the monster landing on Michi. He took the opportunity to break one of the fangs off, and used it to stab one of its legs. The monster roared in anger, and Michi scurried from underneath it. While Michi, battered, was recovering from the battle, the monster then located a townsperson's house, imitating Michi as if he was battered and losing the battle against the creature. It tried to sound panicked and begging to be let in. The father moved closer to the door, and slipped the talisman under just as the young man instructed. At which a large flash of light erupted and a scream bellowed from the monster so strong and so loud the entire town heard it. And the illusion was dispelled. Through the rice paper windows, the silhouette of the spider's true form rose up and Michi came running up to the house, screaming, Not today! Michi had jumped off a neighboring roof and did a front flip extending his foot out into an axe kick. Chaka Zaru! He commanded as his foot burst into flames just before cracking down on the spider's head. He then coaxed it back to where they began the battle. This time he was going to finish it. As the monster entered the field, he quickly drew the other three symbols he needed and stomped on them. The first one he finished entrapped the spider in an earthen dome, which gave him time to draw the next one. As he finished it again, he stomped. And the next symbol activated, allowing water to fill the dome. And finally, he finished the last symbol and stomped on it. A large set of poles struck the mound and pinned the monster in place. He dropped to his knee and placed one hand on the connecting lines between the symbols that then made a pentagram. I call upon the spirits of the five elements to seal and banish evil from our realm. The lines began to glow. Wood grows from earth, fire consumes the wood. Ash fertilizes earth, and metal is brought forth. As he completed each verse, 
the respected line connecting the two named Alex began to intensify their light. Be gone! Placing his oath hand on the symbol, chains made of each element burst forth from their respective symbols and pulled the Skigoma into a portal. It screamed and howled as it was banished. When the spell was done, Michi breathed a sigh of relief, as well as began panting a bit, before falling unconscious in the middle of the village. I was snapped back to my own time again. This time, I looked around, with that feeling of eyes on me again, but closer. I had adjusted to the darkness and began wrapping up the book when I heard an unfamiliar voice from behind me speak. Do not read that too much. A humanoid figure said as it presented itself. I looked over the figure. It was roughly five feet tall, wrinkled, and had divots in its body, like that of eye sockets. And as I looked around the room, something caught my eye. Little tiny eyeballs crawling about the walls and ceilings, the optical nerves acting as tentacles and anchoring its eyeballs to the surface. What the fuck? I exclaimed and scurried away from the figure. It spoke in a calm demeanor. I'm not going to harm you. I have watched you and your team. You seem to want to help preserve these scrolls and books, but beware the one you hold. You are now susceptible to the other world. The wandering eyes one by one made their way to the figure and began plunging themselves into the empty divots as it spoke. Just like humans, yokai can be bad or good. Beware of all of them. The figure turned to leave before speaking one more sentence. You will be targeted by evil yokai from now on, as you will taste good. The figure vanished into the darkness. That had to have been Ahyakume. My team arrived about an hour later, and we began our daily work. This concludes Michi's Journey Part 3, by your fantastic author, Kyle Brant. Wow, that was a great story. Thank you so much for sending the next part of Michi's journey to me. I am always enthralled at your style, and how you bring such a different genre of stories to this channel. Nothing quite like a monster fight to get the blood pumping, and it was great to see that Michi did not get ripped in half in this episode. I was seriously worried as I read this that Michi's going to come back with his hair either completely white at this point, or at least missing a couple of his toes. Cheers mate, thanks again for sending this in, and I look forward to more stories around Michi's journey. Well awesome fans, I just wanted to say thank you for listening, thank you for supporting me, and I'm going to continue to narrate more and more stories just for you. And if you have any stories of your own listeners, or even requests, send them to me to this email address, storiesfablesghostlytales at gmail.com. Even just to say hi, I talk to every person that takes the time to reach me, so don't hold back. So my magnificent listeners, it's that time. This is the place where stories live, and you tale tellers come to listen. Enjoy your day or night, and join me every weekday for our creepy tradition. And as always, Till next time.